Welcome to the Scottish podcast by Scottish people about Scottish things. We're three lifelong friends and displaced Scotsmen who get together to talk about our homeland, the weird stuff that happens there, and to remind us why we are the way we are. Welcome to This'll Do Nicely. Hello everybody and welcome to today's story with Rory. A welcome to today's Taking the Piss with Chris. <laughs> Let's get Bonnie with Johnny. Hey! <laughs> It only took us three months, but we got there. Oof. Ah, I love it. Good workshopping, Johnny. I'm glad you, you were able to bring something to the table. That's impressive. It's taken me the whole week to just bring back what we decided last week. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I'm glad you did it. It's usually the way. We sound incredibly professional now, so that's the main thing. It's like a proper jingle almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's better than the uh, the non-existent uh, second <laughs> version of our theme tune. Look, the minute did. we start calling this season two, there will be new, new music coming. All right. All right. I'll take your word for it. Okie dokie. You, you, you boys, have you ever heard of um, the mythical Scottish animals, Dugs? <laughs> ah, the wee Dugs. Wee Dugs Aye, and big Dugs. Dugs. No, I haven't. <laughs> So, I know I know we talked about um, Kelpies last year, last week, and uh, we kind of took a dive into folklore and mysticism. I thought we decided offline that we weren't going to do two mythical shows in a row. I know, I know, I know, I know. I but I had some of this research already done. It kind of off the back of what we were researching last week. Um, I just kind of fell into it and it just made sense to kind of do it again this week. So are we doing ice cream wars again? <laughs> no, no, no. We're doing we're doing dugs. So they 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 are um Scottish creatures of um you know folklore that are live they also sticky like the horses. <laughs> they can be sticky. Right. They're they're definitely hairy. Four legged generally they have a snout some of them have long hair, some of them have short hair. They do have tails. When dugs are happy, they will wag their tails. When they're unhappy, they'll get kind of aggressive and growl and bark. I think I think I might have seen an exhibit on them once at the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, <laughs> now that you mention this. So yeah. what happened in that gallery in your young life, Chris? <laughs> Coming back to me. Have you guys, uh, have you ever had any interactions with dugs? Uh, I don't know. I knew I, I knew a guy called Doug at university. Is that the same thing? <laughs> no, no, that's a different spelling. I'm talking D U G. Do they have any of those? I think you said in kelpies they had the power to create thunder as they hit their tails in the water. Do, they, do these dogs have any similar traits? They're they have the power to be to sit, to roll over, uh, <laughs> stand in puddles, <laughs> <laughs> to roll in duck shit. Yeah, you know, that, okay, okay, fine, I'm going to stop this because I don't know how much longer I can keep this going. We're talking about dogs, we're talking about the dogs of Scotland, the different breeds. Oh. Yes. Oh. Yes. Are you saying Scot Scotland invented the dog? Because that is a huge flex. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Wow. Uh, we've got the facts to back it up. <laughs> I love we've made it this far into however many episodes and no one has yet stopped us and said, you guys didn't invent any of the any of these things it's quite impressive like 30 odd episodes in yeah we invented the Aust the australian kelpie we, we established that yes. last month so yeah yeah and you know there's I, well we've got i think something like five or six breeds that we're going to talk about today all of them originating from scotland but you know seeing as we are talking about dogs that come solely from scotland you know obviously you can tell that like scotland is where they orig originated from chris do you want to talk to us about bloodhounds yeah you've uh you've done me up there rory <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you, you, you what you've Basically, you sent us round a list of dogs that you claimed Scotland invented, and I said I would take the Bloodhound and the Deerhound, and I can, you know, I've had the Bloodhound gang song in my head all week. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. And then, lo and behold, lo and behold, the Bloodhound was, is Belgian. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't my fault. Wait, are you saying Scotland invented Belgium as well? Well, Johnny, I mean, the research isn't there, but I would imagine so. <laughs> Can the Belgians prove that we didn't invent them? Uh, no, but I mean, the Bloodhound does, uh, in my extensive research, I've found an affinity for waffles and 
<laughs> you know, being being quite conflicted about what language it speaks. <laughs> Yeah, no, look, I just got done dirty by a website that said it was something like the top 15 dog breeds from Scotland and Bloodhound was on it. But it seemed, I think it was just that it was bred in Scotland for hundreds of years. It didn't actually originate. You're right. It came from Belgium. No, no. The research says there has never been a Bloodhound in Scotland. So. <laughs> Not one. No. Jesus. Not one. No, the closest it got was uh, the the when Sherlock Holmes, the dog and the deer stalker, but that's England. It wouldn't go past the wall. <laughs> so, you know. Well, yeah. um, no, I'm really, I'm really, I'm furious. I'm I know. Furious, actually, I'm, I'm sorry that you wasted four days worth of research on bloodhounds <sighs> just to find out that they're not actually from Scotland. So, well, I'm going to kick us off with one that did actually originate in scotland and for certain that's where it came from um i'm gonna be talking first of all about golden retrievers did you know they were scottish that's big isn't it that's, uh, that's a i mean no. that's not messing no, about it's no like normal nah. breed that that's a that's a big dog that is quite it's, a, it's, a, it's a premier league dog that yeah, yeah. that's really really coming out of the park swing it makes it makes sense though like they are gen aren't they generally um, known to be uh, you know ver they have a voracious appetite they can't stop eating and uh, <laughs> are gen generally known as a sort of sim simple creature so which describes an awful lot of Scottish people. Uh, I've got one later on that I'm going to talk about that is just us like Scots to a T. It is the perfect dog. We shouldn't have gone any further from this, but yeah, the golden retriever. I mean, like yeah, coming. Out, it is a big dog in all types of categories it is regularly known as the world's most popular dog it is a good it's a good boy it's a very good boy <laughs> and it's known for its yellow or golden coats its affable personality and its energetic behavior um it's actually ranked number four in the intelligence list so uh, a wee bit of where they came from and we can this is one of the things scottish things that we can trace exactly where it came from which is some what? sort of miracle i know <laughs> We have to go back to the 1800s, and there's a Scottish businessman, politician, lord, and baron, Dudley Coots Marjorie Banks. And he technically, they say his last name is pronounced Marchbanks, but it's spelled Marjorie Banks. So I'm oh, going yeah. to call him Marjorie. We Banks. all know. We all <laughs> yeah. know Marjorie. You got bullied in school. Yeah. I mean, his. I'm just going to take this guy is. They like born 1820, son of a senior partner to, in Coots Bank, which is the eighth oldest bank in the world. He is just like devastatingly rich, inherited this huge fortune, and then ended up going and buying this deer forest in Uchigan, uh, in the kind of northwest of Scotland, kind of uh, just west of Ness. But, you know, this is hardcore Scottish aristocrat. Aristocracy? Aristocracy? What do I say? Aristocracy. Aristo aristocracy. That's the one. <laughs> aristocracy. I do like it. Aristocracy. Aristocracy. I felt like a minute there I was talking to the uh, golden retriever and up. <laughs> Squirrel. Yeah, so this is, you know, some of the old school super rich. Um, like I said, that he bought an entire forest and he turned it into an estate. And it was in this estate that he developed the golden retriever breed. And basically they were bred for hunting, shooting, gaming, essentially. Uh, guns at the time were getting better and faster and more accurate um, with better range. And so they were finding that the retriever dogs that they were using at the time were inadequate, especially for the waterlogged, boggy Scottish terrain. You know, what, what, they were shooting the, you know, fowl, the ducks or whatever, and the, the dogs they were using weren't able to retrieve them properly. And so he wanted to make a better retriever. 1865, Baron Tweedmouth, as he was known at the time, bred a yellow-haired, wavy-coated retriever called Noose with a now-extinct Tweedwater Spaniel called Bell. The breed is extinct. Well, Bell's extinct as well. Should be old. Um, and they had four <laughs> yellow puppies. <laughs> Ada, Crocus, Crocus, C-R-O-C-U-S, Primrose, and Arist Cowslip. It's Aristocrat. It's aristocrat. <laughs> aristocrat. So they had these four yellow puppies, and that was the original uh, litter from all other golden retrievers came from. And they had a, a splash of Irish setter at some point, 
and a little bit of the flat coated retriever thrown in just to kind of mix things up a little bit. And basically out of this, they got these intelligent, agile, energetic dogs that we and pretty much everybody on the planet love today. Um, their double coats make them easier for kind of working in water and they were bred to have this soft bite, which means that they're perfect for retrieving game without damaging it. And that's kind of why they're also so good uh, as family pets. They just pick up your children and bring them to you rather than bite yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. Right. They can go and retrieve them from the, the marshes of Scotland, <laughs> yeah. the bogs. So like I said, like nowadays they rank as one of the best breeds in the world. President Ford uh, had one. Uh, Betty uh, Elizabeth Warren currently has one. They're always in movies because they're easy to train and they're good looking. You know, Airbud is a great example of that. Do, do you know Elizabeth Warren well enough to call her Betty? Is, is that you're just old pals or something? Yes. Right. Fair enough. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for the clarity. <laughs> it's it's better it's better than poker hunters, isn't it? Like oh, yeah, yeah. And she must yeah. prefer that, right? I mean, yeah, she's surely. probably she's probably a reader. <laughs> Who knows? So <laughs> not anymore. She switched off. <laughs> yeah, and look, they're amazing dogs. They're very very good boys. Um, and good girls as well. I just watched an amazing video of Kira helping her owner rescue two dogs trapped in the water of a frozen pond, which was pretty damn incredible. Like the guy was shirtless, swimming through literally this frozen pond, breaking the ice as he went. And then Kira would go ahead and basically shepherd the dog that was stuck in the ice back onto land as he then pummeled through. I'd highly recommend um, YouTubing this. And then the main reason that I wanted to do this episode is because a few, you know, weeks ago I stumbled upon this video of, um, so there's a golden retriever club in Scotland and in 2018 they held a gathering to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the breed and 361 golden retrievers all met at the, their ancestral home in, uh, what did I, what did I say earlier? Yushigan. Um, house to celebrate the breed and the the video is just as amazing as you would how many expect. people do you think went home with the wrong golden retriever <laughs> after that <laughs> they i mean that's the thing they all look exactly the same yeah. but they're just like it's just this like um you know estate this beautiful estate with these huge gardens and all this land and just literally hundreds of golden retrievers just sitting around <laughs> like wagging amazing the tail image. just being all happy yeah they they apparently the same club uh, had a smaller gathering a few years before and they had this like owner and dogs torch lit parade <laughs> around the grounds as well which again would have just been phenomenal to see so that's brilliant yeah i mean they're quite striking because they're so light colored right particularly in the sort of dark <laughs> dark dim marshes of yeah. scotland they sort of stand out as something much more um recognizable yeah, I mean, that's the thing, like, they're so, I, I know them as family pets, and they're so mm. kind of floppy and, yeah, bright and sunshiny. I would never, I didn't know that they were Scottish until I saw this video of them um, at the, in the estate, and I just wouldn't, I, like, Scottish dogs should be kind of hardy and <laughs> yeah rough, yeah you know? it doesn't quite add up does it it's like yeah they, they get because it's very obvious when they're dirty because they're they look so clean all the time and so like blonde <laughs> and like yeah. luscious long hair and it's like the idea of it like scampering through the swamps and the marshes it's like mm, i don't know it's yeah oh, it's actually sorry guys i've just seen that the golden retriever actually originated in <laughs> belgium <laughs> No, if the golden retriever originated ever, anywhere, it would be like Australia or Sweden. Somewhere like tall, blonde, and incredibly good looking. <laughs> and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Shots fired against Australia, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, leave the Swedes out of it. <laughs> yeah, golden retriever is Belgian. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the they're end of that. not, they're that's definitely do. Scottish. They're a hundred percent Scottish guaranteed. Huh. I did the research. Um, all right. So <laughs> onto, onto another Scottish breed, uh, Jonathan, I think. Yeah. You... I'd like to talk about the Belgian Collie. 
God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure, although I was laughing because one of the first things I read about Collies, which is sort of becoming a mantra, as you alluded to earlier for this podcast, is that their exact origins are shrouded in mystery. (laughs) (laughs) Of course they are. Of course. Brilliant. But they, I mean, the Collie, the sort of lineage of Collies has now become like many 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 breeds but they sort of all trace back to kind of the early 1800s or even the 1700s where i think that the closest people seem to attribute them is like a combination of celtic dogs from the north of scotland norse spitz dogs which i think were the kind of vikings coming over to the north parts of scotland and then a sort of some of the roman cattle dogs that were used for herding alongside anglo-saxon dogs so there's kind of this crazy route back to like lots of variants of the same thing but they've kind of typically been known as like herding dogs so often in the highlands of scotland used for herding sheep and cattle they're very active dogs in a way i think they're where the golden retriever like now you know it as this sort of family friendly very lovable thing all these in my mind are much more like a Land Rover, they're like made for the outdoors. <laughs> they're kind of the ones that uh, they always do well in like the agility tests in crufts and stuff. Yes, so they they seem to have this split between seen as like show dogs, so the kind of lassie variety of collies often mm. are seen as these kind of like long luscious <laughs> blonde dogs. That I like forgot that they're there. collies. Yeah, they're part of the collie family. But then the other thing I'd forgotten about that I was a kind of interesting memory is like the show dog tr- trials, where there's like a competitive league of more like farming dogs, which used to be I have a memory of it being on TV growing up now and again yeah no i remember seeing the documentary uh babe and (laughs) yeah that one there was that really ugly collie (laughs) that um it could speak to the sheep that was a pig it was a i thought it was a dog that wasn't a collie that's the belgium variety of the (laughs) collie hairless Uh, but the the sheepdog trials um, were amazing things yeah i i this was like sunday night tv or something right yeah i remember watching this and it was just it should have been so boring but it was one of those things that just hypnotized you just watching yeah a farmer in a field whistling at a dog and the dog running around and just herding sheep into a pen and it was like this is this is it, fascinating. Yeah, I'd, I, I'd kind of forgotten about it until I started reading about them again. I, I had the same thing. I was like, yeah, that was on TV regularly. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, it's such mm-hmm. a strange thing to watch. And I think the whole thing was that the owner has, can't leave their spot. So it is all done with commands and whistles. And and actually, Collies are interesting because I think they rate as one of the mo- I think they're number one or one or two on, on that scale of like the intelligence for dogs. So they're obviously yeah. very good at taking commands. I read this interesting thing that was talking about because obviously they've got quite thick coats. They're typically like tipped ears for sort of listening to the winds rolling in across the, the valleys and, the, you know, in the outdoors in Scotland. But there was this line that said, even the white spot on the tail tip is there to shine in the dark night like a lighthouse, making the dog visible to both shepherd and sheep. I was like, oh. uh, I don't know if that's accurate, I mean, but we'll go with it. That sounds like poetic ravenous history, but I like it. Just a lovely way of describing having yeah. a white spot on their tail, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a nice way of uh, making what could be a negative into a talking point. <laughs> yes, that's yes. very true. Yes, um, it's lovely. I mean, the, the thing you read about them often is like they have the very strong herding instincts to the point that if you're not careful with them, they will like start to nip at the heels of wayward children and, and like round <laughs> them up. So they're, they're sort of encouraged to be well-trained because their instinct to herd things is so strong that they'll just start doing it to whatever's around them. Um, so I you're did saying re- you can just leave your kids with them and they'll look after them? Well, they'll certainly keep them in one place. I would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might actually look into investing yeah. in one of those. That might um, sounds useful for you, Chris. <laughs> might, might might solve a few problems for me, actually. <laughs> yeah. Also, I I found there was a Scottish Collie Preservation Society. Not the, not the Kinks song, slightly different, but um, <laughs> they wrote this thing about there are stories recorded of collies who helped their masters by driving their sheep south to market in London. Then, when tired of waiting at the pub doors for the master to return, just decided to go home on their own. These brave collies travelled the whole wait. length of England to reach their home farms and the work which they knew was waiting for them. The, wait, the collies the collies drove their master to the market. <laughs> yes. They're, I told you they're intelligent. He did it's, he did say that they're a land rover of dogs, so checks out. Wow. 
That is amazing. There is, I'll come God. on. Remind me about cars later because there is a brilliant fact about cars that I'll, I'll come on to. Um, I mean, again, in the spirit of not knowing any um, defined history of the origin, there seems to be a few interpretations of even the name Collie. Some say it's the Scots word for coal. Um, others say the word Cooley inspired it, which was what the the blackface mountain sheep were called in Scotland. And then there's also this idea that Collie comes from the Gaelic word for useful. So take your pick, lads. <laughs> Whatever you like, really. Uh, yeah, the um, only I only I only heard blackface there, so that's uh, we'll rule that uh, one. It's, it's difficult to um, you know say anything good about the collie or, or sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot there was blackface sheep. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, that I mean, they're quite well known, particularly in the kind of border collie variety, which is the one you would see like shepherds having a lot. But there's some famous ones like Lassie, obviously, very was a collie. Uh, people will know from the books, the TV show. Um, if you if you're in the UK, you probably know a TV show called Blue Peter, where there was a very famous border collie called Shep in like mm -hmm. the late 70s and early 80s. There was also a story about another Shep who seemed to somehow get a statue because it appeared one day at the Great Northern Railway Station in 1936 in Fort Benton, Montana, and it watched its owner's coffin loaded onto the train. So I think it had been owned by this person who died. And then it waited for his return at the station for five and a half years, and so became this kind of celebrity at the station until sadly it was killed by a train in 1942. Oh, <laughs> so Jesus <that's> Christ! <laughs> pretty awful. <laughs> But they put a little. I think they made a little statue to the dog at the end, which is kind of nice. Um, he just got fed up waiting. He's like, "That's it. I can't yeah, take it anymore." Yeah. It's like it's too much. He's not coming back. Just con the dog's constantly looking at the uh, the train being delayed on the screen. Just like, I've, I've got stuff to do here. I guess I'll go back. I guess I'll go back to the shop and get some fizzy water and some a Twix. <laughs> it's raining as well. Oh, um, poor shit. Yeah, poor shit. And then lastly, uh, Robert Burns had a border collie called Lewis, who he... Oh, probably, here we go. And let me guess, he did a poem about it. a poem the, about him called yeah, The Two Dogs. Yeah. But I, I'm not going to read it, but you can check it out if you want to. And then there, similarly, there's one other kind of famous collie, which I think, again, was a border collie called Old Hemp that was lived in like the 1890s that people sort of say that's the original border collie that all border collies came from. Like all lines trace back to Old Hemp. Which is kind of old hemp was just a massive shagger. Yeah, apparently. Um, and then the bit about the car, because I'd read this bit about them. Should have um, should have called him old hump. Hey. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the it's been um, a long day. <laughs> in the spirit of the intelligent dogs, uh, so here's some things to prove that border collies particularly are very smart. So one has memorized a thousand different objects. So it's it's known as like it can respond and recognize a thousand different commands and pick up objects based on that which is quite that's, interesting that's like it's 900 more than chris <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, i know at least six <laughs> <laughs> would you like some more border collie facts yes yes striker a border collie from quebec city set the canine record for rolling down a car window in 11.34 seconds and it wasn't an electric <laughs> window <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It rolled down a car window. So in Quebec, they're making their dogs roll down car, <laughs> car mean, windows. It's not. It's a cold place. There's not a lot to do. So guys, yeah, there's a there's, a there's a darker version of that darker version of that story that uh, is Collie dies in outside <laughs> yeah, Quebec tragic. supermarket after being kept in car. <laughs> it, it was just a survival mechanism. They learned how to do it. Just yeah. so, <laughs> that's that's horrendous. It's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, where's, there's another one. Another border collie na named Jumpy holds a Guinness World Record for dog skateboarding 100 meters in less than 20 seconds. I'm into that. That's amazing. Yeah, I'd watch that. Yeah, I'd watch that. In 2008, a border collie mix named Sweet Pea set a record for dog balancing. She balanced a can on her head and walked 100 meters in 2 minutes and 55 seconds. Yeah, I'd watch that as well. I really, good, right? I really hope that was her balancing other dogs. <laughs> I just, just, she was like the bottom of like a pyramid of dogs. Yeah, it was, it was a like golden a retriever on top. at the top. <laughs> it's amazing, amazing sight. <laughs> um, so, so the, I mean, they're pretty, 
uh, solid contenders for good, intelligent, it. loyal dog. I would I would say. I mean, partly related to that, the the other one I looked at a little bit was Sheepdog, which is like the Shetland Sheepdog particularly, which is kind of seen as like the the younger, smaller cousin of the Collie, um, sometimes known as the Sheltie. And like I, the thing I thought was interesting is like you've heard about things like Shetland ponies, which are like tiny versions yeah. of horses. I'd never really thought about wh why they exist or why they've been bred that way, but kind of when you read about like the Shetland Sheepdog, which is sort of a small, like rugged version of a of a um, collie, part of the reason is they were talking about you know the Shetland Islands are basically the the, the northernmost northernmost part of Scotland. They're these islands that are out on their own, uh, and so like in that kind of harsh cold climate, food can be scarce, and so they didn't want to use so much feed to feed animals. Oh, so wow. having sm smaller versions of them makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Whether this is true or not, I was like, this is kind of wild, but. It made me think I, so that why no one, about no one in ponies. Shetland is, no one in Shetland is over five foot two. <laughs> yeah, also just like farmyards full of like tiny chickens and micro pigs. I just assumed it was so that like <laughs> it's so windy up there that when the wind blew them over, they'd have l less distance to fall. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I'd never really considered them much. I just thought they were a kind of unusual breed of horses, but now it makes much more sense. Interesting. <laughs> the thing is that you start to see all these like stupid little things in dog breeding world where the original name was the Shetland Collie, but it caused controversy amongst the rough collie breeders of the time. So the name was formally changed. And like, it's, I couldn't find any more about that. But just imagining these like raging breeders clubs going, no, 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 no you can't be, you can't be yeah. a Shetland Collie. We own the Collie and it's ours. Yeah, I, I read a bit about that. Uh, four people died in that battle. Um, the <laughs> the battle of Collie. Collie bench. battle, yeah. <laughs> That's all I got on, on Collies and Shetland Sheepdogs. Well, Chris, I mean, you did look into one non-Belgian dog, I believe. Yes, I did. I did. And I, quite interesting on, I was quite interested in this one because it's not a dog I'm too familiar with. I haven't come across too many in my time, but the Deerhound is the one that I was, I was signed homework for. And yeah, Johnny alluded to you, Rory, uh, saying no one knows the origins of this stuff, but I just want to read out this passage from the American Kennel Club that puts your disclaimers to to shit really yeah so you should think about <laughs> all right think about re rephrasing the way that you uh you you introduce topics okay okay, okay. So, this is from the complete dog book the american kennel club the origin of the deerhound breed is of such antiquity and the earliest names bestowed on it so inextricably mixed that no sound conclusion to be arrived can be arrived as, as to whether the deerhound was at one time identical with the ancient irish wolf dog and in the course of centuries bred to a type better suited to hunt deer or whether as some writers claim he is a descendant of the hounds of the picts so i mean you know that's are they available for like freelance voiceover work or writing for podcasts i i'm just saying rory you know you could use the phrase such antiquity and inextricably mixed you'd probably say an antiquity <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean i'd mispronounce all of them i, I yeah. It just, just think about pun punching up your, you know, your blurbs. That's all. I'm a I mean, straight I'll talker, Chris. And... You know, I'm a man of the people. I tell it how it is. <laughs> and, you know, I don't like fancy, fancy words. You're blue collar. That's why we love yeah. you. Yeah. I'm a $1 word man, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so the deer hound is uh, massive, right? This big, big hound that is basically bred to hunt deer as you might expect general george custer had deer hounds mm. it's, that's one of the more famous ones and apparently his deer hound tuck was killed at a uh, little bighorn oh wow um so big big uh, casualty there oh, yeah custer wrote of her that tuck regularly comes when i'm writing and lays her head on the desk rooting up my hand with her long nose until i consent to stop and notice her <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good girl it was a good girl, exactly. So the thing about the Deerhound is that it's been this kind of very highly esteemed dog uh, over the centuries to the extent that the desire for ownership of it has has uh, left it endangered at many times. The, as the larger versions of them kind of became 
extinct or rare in England and southern Scotland. Uh, the greyhound started taking the place of the deerhound. And so the highlands were kind of for a while the last territory where the stag remained numerous in a wild state and mm. therefore kind of became the last stronghold of the deerhound as well. Apparently then the Highland Chieftains stepped in in an attempt to rebreed it and yeah. get the numbers back up. Can I ask about the deer, the actual deer hunting in their in the, their origin story? Were they used to sort of like chase deer out of hidden places? Or are they actually chasing deer down or, you know, how were they used? <sighs> Glad you asked that, Johnny. I've just come to that. <laughs> um, yeah. So the deer, ha the deer hound has a keen scent. Uh, it's used in track, could be used in tracking, but it's because it's such a big dog. It's a combination of strength and speed that can then cope with taking on the larger deer, which which can weigh up to two hundred and fifty pounds. So it does hunt deer. The dog can be two hundred and fifty pounds. No, no, no. The deer can be two hundred and fifty right. pounds. Yes. Uh, right. So it's it's got to take down a, a big fucker. Having said that, because it's kind of always been this companion of you know highland chieftains it's got this insatiable desire for human companionship yeah and and even though it does hunt enormous deer it's it's apparently quite a quiet and dignified dog uh keen and alert although not aggressive it's also used in the u.s apparently the hunting of antlered game with dogs is outlawed in the u.s oh um so the deer hound is used to take on wolves coyotes rabbits i mean i'm sure Jesus. you could take a rabbit out no bother i think i know them predominantly from like old-timey paintings so you would see something that would hang over a fireplace or something and it would be some yeah. highland visage or, or landscape with guys in kilts and these tall, gangly deer hounds like kicking about as well. Interestingly, when when the breed was kind of going down, uh, which apparently is also attributed to the collapse of the clan system, uh, which mm. came after Culloden, which again is a subject that we need to get to at some point. Um, the rest, the restoration of the breed didn't kind of come about until 1825, and that was undertaken by Archibald and Duncan McNeil. Mm. Um, the deerhound then kind of regained its place. Then, in the First World War, and later, to, uh, later on, the breed. Uh, so many of the largest states in Scotland and England uh, kind of had the dogs there as well, and I believe it's known as the kind of royal dog of Scotland. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's it's a dog that's, as you say, Rory, it kind of pops up in these portraits. It's a dog of historical interest, and I yeah. think it's because it's pictured in old Highland estates and things. And Walter Scott had a famous deerhound, Sir Walter Scott, called uh, Maida. Um, he called her the most perfect creature of heaven. He's he's coming up again in in, in a week. Wow! <laughs> You're not telling me he's got another dog that he cheated on Maida with, are you? Well, maybe. I don't want to spoil it, but he was a dog lover. That's what I'll say. Oh, oh that's, uh, <laughs> that's a Couple deer facts. They're not as interesting as yours, Johnny. I mean, you you went above and beyond there, so I've got to give you a hat tip. The more recent younger viewers and readers might know a deerhound from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. A deerhound played the role of Padfoot, which was Sirius Black's canine form yeah. in two of the oh, films. Right, yeah. I remember yeah. looking quite mangy and um, uh, I actually always thought that was a werewolf, I'm not going to lie. Or I might be mixing them up with... Uh, I think or, there or probably is... probably mixing them up with another character. I think there is a werewolf. I don't want to get the Potter heads on me. Oh, God. <laughs> To be the last thing I need. <laughs> Spilliamus! Yeah. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to the Scottish Deerhound Club of America, who I'd had a little bit of correspondence with. Sadly, I wasn't kind of able to get a bit more from them before we started recording. I, I, we can put this on social media after. They've got this amazing trophy called the Dunkeld Trophy, which I'll send you guys a picture of afterwards, but it's basically like normal on the bottom but it's this magnificent uh, deer hound's head on the top it looks so noble and it would just be a fantastic trophy to oh, have wow. in your cabinet um i would check out the website deerhound.org uh, they've got tons of information on there about the history of them that's where i stole a lot of the stuff that i just said so yeah that's that's the scottish deer hound really i i'd Are love there... to give you more on uh, numbers and stuff but I, I was a bit rushed today and i'm sorry that i, I didn't bring more to the table hey hey chris <laughs> you don't need to apologize you did you did great you did great yeah you did... I, I if i just wish that i hadn't spent five bloody days on the bloodhound <laughs> yeah i mean yeah lesson learned 
This will, yeah, this will learn you. All right. Well, I'm gonna take us out with probably probably the the most stereotypical Scottish dogs. You know, the other ones like the the deerhound. As much as I remember those paintings, I wouldn't I wouldn't have known they were exactly Scottish dogs. Collies is the same thing. Definitely golden retrievers. I never knew they originated in Scotland. On the other hand, terriers and the variety of Scottish terriers, just hardcore Scottish. Like <laughs> they just feel Scottish, don't they? Something about yeah, even the name. Yeah, there's <laughs> Every, everything about their personality just screams Scottish. Yes, a hundred percent. And it was an absolute delight reading about them. And there, there's five five different versions of uh, or breeds of terriers that originate in Scotland. And um, you know, we just love a terrier in Scotland. That's why we. We got different versions of them, so I'm going to take you through a few of them. All right, we're going to start start with the obvious one, which is the Scottish Terrier, the the Scotties, or also known as the Diehards, which I didn't realize they're just so badass that they got the nickname the 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 deer the Diehards. <laughs> they're called Scottish Terriers, and they perfectly describe Scottish people. They're big dogs in little dogs' bodies. They're feisty, independent, sometimes excitable. Need moderate exercise and do well living in cities or countries. As adults, their behavior can become moody. Yep, that's it. That's that's all Scottish people in. I just described you. Describe you. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's why I was just like, yep, I love them. They're so they're the the they're wee dogs, small sized, tend to be black. They're wiry kind of coats. They groomed. They they tend to be groomed that look like they're wearing a wee skirt, like. The other dogs that we've talked about, their actual origins are obscure and undocumented. But they think they come from Aberdeen, which is in the northeast of Scotland, and they're known originally as the Aberdeen Terrier. Um, they do think they date back to the 1700s. The characteristics that we know them as today uh, formed around the 1800s. But there are paintings and descriptions of dogs that, you know, seem and and look and sound a lot like scotties that go as far back as the 1400s and these guys are bred primarily for catching like small animals like foxes rats badgers rabbits all that sort of thing franklin roosevelt had one called Fala, and there's actually a statue of Fala, his wee scotty beside him at the fdr memorial which is quite nice i looked it up it's uh just you know sitting beside him I thought it was lovely. George W. Bush had two, Barney and Mrs. Uh, no, sorry, Miss Beasley. She wasn't married. <laughs> the <laughs> the dog piece on the Monopoly board is a Scottish. Oh, no, wait, you, you missed a great bit about Barney. Barney infamously bit a reporter that got too close to him. Oh, I didn't know this. I didn't, I didn't read yes. this. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was an incident at the time. Well, this is a thing. All terriers running through them, they're, they're very, territorial is the wrong word, but very, very loyal to their owners. Um, and they will, you know, maybe Barney was a bit older and he was a bit moody. Barney was and actually so in the Secret Service that he was trained to protect. <laughs> yeah, cost. that's actually, it, it was that, um, uh, the Iraqi guy who threw a shoe, Barney just went for him. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what the entire Olympus Has Fallen franchise is based on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> based on Barney. That is amazing. And these guys, they absolutely crush it in the Westminster Kennel dog show every year. And they are, they're something like the second most winningest dog, winning the best in show nine times overall, which is pretty damn impressive. I've, I've just found a picture of uh, Barney on the presidential, presidential lectern and it's really made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> they're good looking dogs. They're yeah, great. He looks very serious. Very uh, serious. Well, he's probably on duty, right? Yeah, well, he is. He's yeah, he's yeah. scanning for threats. Oh, apparently, also, sorry, Roy, to usurp no. you, but apparently, uh, once Vladimir Putin made fun of uh, Barney because he felt that a world leader should own large, robust dogs wow. and not smaller breeds. Wow, he definitely had a will found, didn't he? And then later, when Putin introduced Bush to Coney, his black lab, Putin reportedly said that Coney is bigger, tougher, stronger, faster, and meaner than Barney. <laughs> I would like to see that fight. Like a Scotty versus a lab? Yeah. Scotty would take him. Oh, honestly, the yeah. lab would be lulled into just being an idiot at some point and like yeah. trying to make friends with it and then be like, got you. Yeah. Yeah, wee bastard, I've got you. I've got you. <laughs> Barney would snap his kneecaps. Yeah. 
I knew I didn't like that Putin fellow. <laughs> yeah. So next up, we've got Westies, West Highland Terriers. If you look at a Scotty dog, you see this uh, wee black dog, and then Westies are just the opposite in terms of color. They're a wee white dog. Westies do tend to have slightly longer legs, apparently. And so Edward Donald Malcolm, the 16th Laird of Poltalock, is credited with developing the breed after another reddish brown terrier was mistaken for a fox and shot. Oh. Yeah. So basically what he, like he had the, the, another terrier, like I said, a kind of reddish brown. It was, they were out hunting, the poor thing got shot and he was like, well, I don't want that ever to happen again. So I need to make something that is bright and visible and <laughs> easily distinguishable in the landscape. And he breeds Westies, which is, wow. you know, pretty interesting. King James VI of Scotland back in the 1500s, he apparently had a dozen of them. So it just loved them. It must have been mayhem. A dozen of yeah, them running around. Right? It's chaos. <laughs> Just carnage. They are hypoallergenic for all you allergy ridden folks out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good to know. They, they So if you want to know what they look like, they're the mascot, mascot of Caesar Dog Food. So I think it's Caesar Dog Food's fairly famous here in America and at home and stuff like that. In Australia, they're the mascot of the Mars Dog Food, which I didn't. I'd never heard of, but there you go. The dog in the uh, the recent hit comedy movie Game Night, starring Jason Bateman <laughs> and the lovely Rachel McAdams, was a Westie named Olivia. Olivia, so Olivia, yeah. I, I don't know if you guys have you seen Game Night. No. Yeah, I don't remember the dog at all. Yeah, it will. It's um, you know the the kind of roundish guy uh, from <laughs> <laughs> from Breaking Bad. <laughs> Plimpton or something his name is and he's, he's uh, in a yeah, bunch of things yeah. he he yeah, has a, yeah. a westie but olivia was also so this dog is is making it big she was also in the the crime thriller widows starring opposite viola davis yeah i believe she had uh, second billing in that film I, after viola davis i think she? so yes one of the last times i was in scotland i met a lovely little westie called rory in fact and he was just delightful. He was a very, very good boy. So, yeah. Was um, was Greyfriars Bobby a, a Westie? No, but I'm a. Oh. Sorry, I've had ruined Perfect. Your... No, no, it's a oh. perfect segue into the Sky Terrier that was Greyfriars Bobby. So that was Westies. Now we're into Sky Terriers. They're a mix of like uh, black, white, a bit of grey. I like them. They're kind of cool looking. Uh, they, when they're on show, their hair tends to be long, but when they're cut short, it's kind of cool and scrappy. Unsurprisingly, they originate from Skye because they're Skye Terriers, which is, uh, you know, island in the northwest of Scotland. Apparently, there's like a bunch of breeds named the Skye Terriers, but the ones fitting the description of the Skye Terrier now date back as far as like the 16th century. They're apparently incredibly loyal, like all Terriers, so much so that there was one dog that was incredibly loyal to Mary, Queen of Scots, and was actually under her dress when she had her head cut off during her execution. And that was said to be a Sky oh Terrier. God. Yeah. That's traumatizing. Right? The poor the poor thing. Like, it's terrible, but that's just the loyalty of them. They couldn't, they wouldn't leave her queen alone. Did that traumatized dog then go and throw itself in front of a train? <laughs> I hope not. Just waited hope... at the guillotine for her to come back for the next five years. Oh, I'm supposed to get the tr train down to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> it probably, I don't know. Yeah, I hope it had a good home. Who knows? So yes, Johnny, Greyfriars Bobby, he was a Sky Terrier. And Greyfriars Bobby may eventually get his own episode because he's arguably the goodest boy in history. And so very, very quickly, the story is that he he was so loyal to his owner that he sat and guarded his owner's grave for 14 years, you know, obviously after his owner's death until Bobby himself passed away. And he's, you know, there's a movie about him. There's a statue of him in Edinburgh. It was like one of the first things that I showed Jane when we first visited Edinburgh was the, the Greyfriars Bobby statue. But part of the confusion I think you have, Johnny, is that he was played by a Westie in the film. Oh, and I right. think that's right. why Westies are a little bit more popular than Sky mm -hmm. Terriers and people get them mixed up a lot. Oh, 
God, why can't we just get to a society where Sky Terriers are played by Sky Terriers <laughs> in movies and we're constantly whitewashing dogs? It's, it's just... I did. You know, Chris... It makes, me si- it makes me sick. You make a very it's good point. Absolute sick. Sky Terriers yeah. need representation. Yeah. There's, there's also a kind of horrible theme of, like, dogs hanging around while their owners are being killed. This is... I can 100% see my current dog uh, hanging around the grave of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're I'm still not, alive. Not pla- yeah, still alive. Very much alive. Uh, comfortable. Comfortable even. And <laughs> He yeah, just doesn't just give a there. shit. <laughs> not that I'm sick. Look, my wife is very healthy. She's not in any imminent danger. Please uh, <laughs> you know, don't misinterpret it. <laughs> Interpret that. Just, there's a clear favorite in my family. <laughs> for the dog yeah there's uh, there, yeah from day one as well oh yeah so sky terriers are actually unfortunately classed as an endangered breed there's so few of them these days and they're not breeding at a you know significant rate and i think that's partly because you know westies are just getting they're getting all the screen time that i think sky terrier should be getting so it's a little bit unfair sucks okay next Terrier, second to last terrier, as uh, a Cairn Terrier. Um, these guys are amazing looking, scrappy little guys. Um, they are again bred for hunting small vermin, small animals. The, according to the Cairn Terrier Club, they have an abil- their ability to ignore pain and continue to fight is legendary, which <laughs> really worries That's, me. Uh-huh. Sense. That sounds like a lot of Glaswegians on a yeah. Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Socky Hall Street is full of people with more pain <laughs> and continuing to fight. Yeah, I mean, they, these guys are amazing. They're, again, similar size uh, to the others. They come in all kinds of color. They, they tend to be short-haired. They can be, like, tan-colored. They can be uh, black, white, uh, uh, tend to be a bit of a mix and all that kind of stuff. But the most famous... Cairn Terrier is Toto in Wizard of Oz. He was a Cairn Terrier called Terry. <laughs> Terry the Terrier. Terry, Terry. Nice. Exactly. That was a. Uh... Uh, do you know in uh, the film Best in Show, isn't the dog that Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy show a Cairn Terrier? You might be right, actually. That didn't make my list, but that sounds very familiar. Like it I looks remember, familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dog looks familiar, but I wouldn't be surprised be, if that was a good terrier. Base. It's a similar. It's a very yeah. similar look, anyway. There was one in I Love Lucy. J. Edgar Hoover actually bred them as well. So apparently, he would give them to high-ranking government officials, which just <laughs> worries me that like there's. Did a... they have a re- they have a recording device up their arse? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Like. That's what I'm terrified of. That he's just sending out these little like. <laughs> why? Why has it got such a big collar? Uh, no reason, but don't don't ever remove it. I didn't know we'd invented chipping animals already. There's a weird lump under his neck. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. This dog's beeping. Why is this dog beeping? Oh, it's just to stop the barking. It's a it's a breed. It's breeding. It's breeding. Uh, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, speaking of you know genetically enhanced dogs mr robot the tv show also that character had a cairn terrier in the kingsman the you know british uh you know comedy action movie the stuffed dog called mr pickle was also a cairn terrier (laughs) colin firth you know had the stuffed dog above his toilet that was a cairn terrier should be called the showbiz terrier it's everywhere yeah, these guys are... I mean, I thought the Westies were, you know, putting themselves about, but the Cairn Terrier, goodness. They're also, apparently, tend to be left-footed, so... <laughs> make of that what you will. <laughs> what? I don't know how I don't know how you find that out. I don't know if you ask them to write their name. I don't know. Like, I don't know. They just... Get them to kick a football. <laughs> yeah, I guess. That's, that's how you do it. They just happen to know that Cairn Terriers tend to be left-footed. I'd love to... I would love to know how much money was wasted by a university uh, on that study. That's how they broke the record <laughs> for that, um, the skateboarding dog. They were just trying to figure out which foot it puts forward first. Yeah. All right. So the last Terrier is the fancily named Dandy Demont Terrier. Uh, so I'll, I'll admit, I've never heard of this guy. 
but I like their story and I like the the way they are. So they're basically the sausage dogs of the terrier world. They have shorter legs and longer bodies, but have the same kind of terrier hair and scrappiness about them. They're just a wee bit, you know, sausagier. <laughs> but they also have a very fashionable poof of hair on top of their heads that keeps them getting referred to as a top knot, which I don't believe is technically accurate, but I mean, they, they're, they're cool looking little dogs. They tend to come in a kind of mustard or peppery color. The breed itself is said to have come from the town of Selkirk, which is in the south of Scotland near the borders. And it originates from a wee dog called Old Pepper. Oh, Yeah, very popular name. But the reason I mentioned uh, Walter Scott earlier, um, so the poet novelist Sir Walter Scott was kicking around this area at the time and he was writing a novel called Guy Mannering. It's a very famous and popular novel. In it, there is a character who was a farmer and a terrier owner, and he was called Dandy Demont. And he was based on a local guy called James Davidson. And it's from that novel and that character where the dogs got their names. The suggestion is that basically during this time, along with one of Walter Scott's own dogs, that's where the breed came from. That is the like a, one of the original litters was you know a lo this local guy uh, James Davidson, I believe's dogs plus one of uh, Walter Scott's dogs, and then they eventually became the Dandy Demont Terriers. So there you go. <laughs> I've just looked up a, a photo of them. I mean, they definitely have got that look of. It's like a normal terrier being badly painted. It's like, oh, I got the legs too short and the body too long. <laughs> yeah, just stretched and squashed a wee bit. Yeah. Yeah. Great looking things. But yeah, I mean, that's it. That's all our terriers. That's There's a whole bunch of them. Of and terriers, they're all. Isn't there? Yeah, but they're that's amazing. A lot. That's a lot. <laughs> all right. So, which out of them, which would you guys choose? Not the terriers, but all the dogs we talked about. Oh, good question. The, probably the bloodhounds. Why are you so upset by that? Really? I just because I was wondering. I thought I, I meant okay. I'll re which of the Scottish dogs that we talked about? <laughs> yeah, I've never seen you, you look so deflated. <laughs> <laughs> Does it on purpose? <laughs> I got to. I got to give it to Greyfriars Bobby. I feel. Um, I, I I didn't know it was endangered, and I feel like the Westie has stolen an awful lot of its thunder. And it's a great little dog, and it's clearly an incredibly loyal dog. Albeit a very stupid dog. <laughs> Gotta give it to that. The Sky Terrier. The story brings a tear to my eye every time I read it. And the statue <laughs> the statue in Edinburgh is is worth it. Like th that statue in Edinburgh has captured the likeness of that dog's soulful eyes better oh. than any statue of any human that's ever been captured. <laughs> yes. That's very true. God, that yeah. Yeah. There's gonna be that's gonna be a train wreck of an episode when we do Greyfriars Bobby properly. It's gonna be all over the place that day. Full of tears. <laughs> yeah. Johnny, which of the, the dogs we talked about would you choose? Do you know, I've got a soft spot for golden retrievers. Not that I ever had one, but we had a dog that was a, like a lab cross Springer Spaniel. So he was quite a big beast and very, very lovable and a bit idiotic as well. <laughs> like mm. a completely stupid dog, but loved everything and everyone. And I kind of, in a way, I think golden retrievers are probably a bit smarter than he was, but I think they're... The ones I've known growing up of like people that had them, they've always been very, very lovable beasts. And so I've got a bit of a soft spot for them, I think. I yeah, of course. I mean they're 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 bred to pretty much to be the perfect pet, so I get it. I think I don't know, the the Cairn Terriers just look amazing, but the description of the Scotties just, you know, independent, sometimes excitable. As adults, their behavior can become moody. It's just like, that's that's exactly the type of dog I want. They just sound amazing. Mm -hmm. Sums you up very well, Rory. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I mean, I'll leave us with, you know, a genuine, sincere thought of like, I mean, we spent the entire episode talking about specific breeds of dogs. But um, I would say that if you you want a dog, instead of going to a breeder, go to an adoption agency. Don't shop adopt, as they say. 
Um, you know, even with the adoption agencies, you can get specific breeds sometimes, uh, or you can get amazing mutts that almost always have some sort of terrier in them. So I just want to say that I grew up with dogs that we got from breeders, but we, uh, and we loved them all and they were all great. But my parents both adopted older dogs whose previous owner had died and they were in a sticky situation. And then my uh, my wife and I adopted a dog four years ago from a rescue facility, and we 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 still don't know how he got there. Um, that was kind of one of the th odd things that we we just don't know what happened, what his backstory mm. was, which is kind of sad. And um, yeah, I think it's aside from having a child, the the best thing we've ever done. I mean, Pepper's a phenomenal dog. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me, you know, releasing his name to the the readers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, we, we can we can bleep it out. Yeah, you treat him a lot like uh, Michael Jackson treated his kids. You take him out with a blanket over his head so that nobody sees him. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, I, and my wife keeps telling me to stop dangling him over a balcony. <laughs> he's he's a very good. No, I I agree. He is. I wouldn't be surprised if he's got a bit of West in him as well. He's got something. Backstory was he's from Belgium. <laughs> he's, I found out for you. He loves waffles. Wait, rescued, rescued from um, Belgium. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, look, there's, uh, to, yeah, uh, look, that right now, especially, there's a lot of pets needing homes, to your point, Chris, especially the older ones, there's certain people that can't look after them right now. I'm going to plug uh, Animal Haven, which I'm very close to, so uh, if you're in NYC, go to Animal Haven, they're a no-kill shelter, um, they take in animals that are nearing their time in other shelters that, you know, don't necessarily hold on to them forever, and... You know, they also rescue dogs from the meat trades around the world, which is just insane. Um, or dogs, you know, locally from dangerous living conditions and try and, uh, you know, rehome them. So, yeah, look, there's some great breeds of dogs out there, but I think adoption is the way forward if you can do it. The, the Animal Haven, I just found out yesterday, the Animal Haven's phrase is adoption. It's the hip option. So. That's so. great. I think we can... I'll get round a uh, classy catchphrase from the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, everybody, this will do, lads. This will do nicely. Thanks for listening, everybody. Just a couple more things. Please don't forget to subscribe and review the podcast on iTunes and Spotify and all other podcasting apps. You can email us at thisldonicelypod at gmail.com. Visit the website thisldonicelypod.com. Visit us on Twitter at thisldopod. All original music in this podcast is written and performed by our very own Johnny Naismith. Please like and subscribe to his YouTube channel and follow him on Instagram at jaw underscore knee underscore loves hugs and kisses from the Thistle Do Nicely pod.